So today's class and essentially the theme for several classes after today um, is again 1D potentials, right? But essentially I will use 1D potentials as an example of studying um, symmetries in quantum mechanics, right? So this is essentially the central theme. It's a very powerful organizing principle for quantum mechanics, for classical mechanics and everything in between. So I definitely urge um, you to ask questions, kind of complain and discuss, you know, to kind of resolve your issues here and now. Um, what I'm going to say, you can broadly see essentially how you would translate some of these ideas to classical mechanics even, right? And so this is very, very, it's very important. And much of what I'm going to discuss today is the beginning of what I would consider, um, uh, you know, an entire point of view of physics, um, you know. So, so to understand the symmetries of a system and then to use the symmetries of the system to actually solve the problem, this is, uh, this is a theme. This is even a, a way of thinking in physics, right? And this way of thinking has, uh, has very deep consequences, has very, very deep um, implications. So let me begin the discussion essentially um, with, uh, with just one, okay, so let me do one, two examples, one which is essentially kind of written abstractly and the other one which is written far more kind of specifically. So let me do the abstract example first. So we did this last time, we essentially did this, we made this discussion when, um, you, we had this discussion when we were talking about a complete set of commuting observables. So I asked you to consider essentially uh, some operator uh, P such that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Right? I said, let's take this, this kind of a system, right? A Hamiltonian H, right? So you should know now that if I, if I define a Hamiltonian, by just staring at the Hamiltonian, you have a physical understanding of what actually the, the underlying physical system is, right? More often than not, it's just written in terms of harmonic oscillator modes or, you know, N-level atoms, so on and so forth. So just by staring at kind of, you know, at some part of the Hamiltonian, you can understand what is underneath, what am I, what am I prescribing underneath? So if I have, you know, h bar omega naught sigma z, right? Then I'm describing a two level atom whose uh, level spacing is two omega naught, let's say. If I say h bar omega n plus half, I'm describing a harmonic oscillator, right? Whose level spacing is omega, right? So, so on and so forth. So by describing the Hamiltonian, I'm already telling you a lot of information about the system. So now um, at an abstract level, what I'm inviting you to consider is I'm asking you to consider um, an operator P, right? How these operators would appear, let's forget about this for the moment. Uh, we, will, we will get to a systematic way of thinking about these operators later. But an operator P such that it commutes with the Hamiltonian, right? At an abstract level. So what we saw essentially was I said, well, if H, right? Right, if this is the eigenvalue equation for the Hamiltonian, then what you can definitely assert is that HP minus PH acting on E lambda is zero, right? And the H can act on E lambda, so what that means is H P E lambda is P times E lambda E lambda, which is, I can rewrite it as E lambda times P, E lambda, right? Fine. Uh, which I just put into brackets there. So this is the discussion that we had last time, right? And now what I want you to consider is what does this mean, right? What it means is that not only is the Hamiltonian not only does the Hamiltonian have an, have, a, have an eigenstate which is E lambda, it has another eigenstate which is P times E lambda, right? And both of these eigenstates are valid eigenstates, right? And what that means is that you have for every kind of 
operator P, you have something very interesting happening. You have a degeneracy in the space, right? But it's also an organizing principle for the quantum states because if uh, if you have two eigenvectors which have the same eigenvalue, we are in essentially a degenerate space, then what you can do is you can essentially take superpositions of them and they will also have the same eigenvalue, right? Do you understand this? If I call P of P times E lambda, if I call it E lambda prime, right? But fully acknowledging that you know, so let me put the prime on the lambda, let's say, right? Or let me put the prime on the state, sorry, right? So that I acknowledge that the underlying eigenvalue is the same, it's just that the states are different. Then if I consider any quantum state psi, right? Which I should technically label with this, you know, lambda, which um, I call alpha E lambda plus beta E lambda prime, Right? And I ask the question, what is the Hamiltonian acting on psi lambda? What is this? Right, you can just do it, right? It's alpha Hamiltonian acting on E lambda plus beta Hamiltonian acting on E lambda prime, right? Which is alpha Hamiltonian acting on E lambda plus beta Hamiltonian acting on P acting on E lambda prime. Uh, e lambda, right? This is the definition of E lambda prime, right? And P acting on E lambda is E lambda, e lambda, e lambda times P E lambda. So this is alpha, right? E lambda, E lambda plus beta E lambda, E lambda prime, right? And so collect the E lambda. Right? So, in fact, any such state for any choice of alpha and beta is also an eigenstate, right? And has the same eigenvalue, E lambda, right? And this is a general statement. Now, I'm actually making a very, very general statement about quantum mechanics, which is what I'm saying is if you have a Hamiltonian which has degenerate energy eigenlevels, right? So, if you have, let's say, you know, um, let's say you're looking at the angular momentum spectrum and then, you know, or, or the hydrogen atom, for instance, right? For any given value of n, right, you have n, l, ml, right, and also ms if you include the spin, right, but in the absence of spin orbit, something complicated, right? If you have n, l, ml, let's say, for every value of n, there is a distinct amount of energy. It's a minus 13.6 by n squared, right? So the energy is distinct, but essentially, if there are all these degenerate l's and ml's sitting around, right? And I'm having a discussion about those levels. And what I'm saying is that whenever you're in, you're in that space, you don't have to essentially pick any given, you know, let's say that there are two eigenstates there, just to not complicate the discussion, right? If there are two eigenstates there, you don't have to pick essentially somehow, you know, these two eigenstates. You could pick any superposition of those eigenstates as the valid basis, right? So all I'm doing with this alpha beta is essentially I'm doing a unity rotation, right? So if I define a new, you know, suppose let's say this is E lambda and E lambda prime. So I could define essentially a psi lambda perpendicular, which is orthogonal to it, right? I won't do it, but you can figure out how to do it, right? And that will also be, if E lambda and E lambda prime are orthogonal, let's say, then that will also be orthogonal, right? I have to show you that this is orthogonal. In my mind it is for some reason that I'm right. But at the abstract mathematical level, is this all clear to you? Yeah. Questions? Yeah? Yes. All you're doing is essentially you're, you're reclassifying the old eigenstates in terms of new eigenstates. So all I'm saying is that there is, there is some choice here which actually makes a little bit of sense, right? And, and 
I'll give you a concrete example which will get you will get you the point across immediately. But no, you don't. The, the answer is that in any basis, you just have whatever eigenstates that you have. It's just that if you apply some new operator, then you get a different classification of what's underneath, essentially. That's all it means, right? Right? Does anyone have a guess as to what P is? An example of P that would be good? Identity is trivial. Because identity, in fact, I, doesn't do anything because it takes all states to itself. So there's no fun in it. Right? Okay, there's no way for you to know unless you've read this, right? So, um, or rather if you guess, then we have to have a, you know, it's a very profound discussion, right? So the most, um, the most famous example is essentially what's called the parity operator, right? The most famous example. Everything, I just want you to understand everything I've just said till now is completely general. For any, any P, any H, I have not made any kind of, I have not needed anything, right, in the arguments that are presented. But if you consider basically what's called the parity op operator, and what the parity operator does is if you give it any function of X, it just flips X to minus X, right? So the parity operator P, acting in position space, what it has the property of doing, is it just flips position to minus x, right? So, come again? I just did, I just wrote that down. Uh, yeah, it's better to see it in the position. But you can write it in, you know, you just have to resolve the identity and you can write it in the, in that basis as well, but yeah, you know. So all that it does is it takes every abstract at x to abstract at minus x. So that's what it does, right, is that, so you can always write, right? Right, and so you can write something like that, right? Uh, sorry, times x. So what the what the parity operator has to do is essentially flip every x to minus x, right? So 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 what I just want to show you what this does before I get into that complication, right? Um, what was that? Yeah. So. So imagine what this does, right? So I just want to show you the argument, the heuristic argument I just want to show you first. So take the Hamiltonian, which is just P squared over 2M, right? And what, what kind of a Hamiltonian is this? It's a free particle. What are its eigenstates? Right? So possible wave functions, right, essentially look like, So let's take let's take essentially you know some normalization times e to the i k x right let's not worry about what that normalization is for a moment right so let's take e to the i k x and what does the parity operator do right so what is the eigenvalue corresponding to this the energy e is what I just want the Hamiltonian acting on the eigenstate is E times the eigenstate, right? So it's H bar square K square over 2 M, right? D square over DX square acting on an exponential function, right? So the parity eigenstate acting on psi of plus X produces psi of minus X, right? And this is what's being said to you. This is essentially the statement that is being given to you, right? And what this means is that psi of minus x is also a valid operator, which you already know, right? Why do I know that the parity operator, why is this a valid operator? Because essentially I have to, oh, sorry. Okay, so I'll call the parity operator pi, just to avoid, sorry, my bad, that I forgot that momentum operator is p as well. It always happens to me. Right? 
right? Where is good? I have fixed almost all instances, right? So that is momentum. And you have to verify essentially that P square over 2M commutes with the parity operator. You can verify this. You can just do it in function space, right? Now, now that, you know, once you have verified it, you can use this. You could take that input and you can make that statement. You could say, aha, so because I have verified that the parity operator commutes with uh, P square, right? Is it easy to see why parity operator should commute with P square? Mathematically, you can check, but is it easy to see why, why it should? Hamilton is symmetric, right? So it's the same, it's the same thing, right? And, and I would say something even more basic, which is d squared over dx squared. So if you take x to minus x, right, d by dx goes to minus d by dx, but the square doesn't do anything, right? So it's, it's trivial for you to see that this is true, right? Okay, so once you have verified that, you could basically assert, it's the same thing that you've said, right? I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, once, you do, once you make that statement, you can assert essentially that this is a wave function as well. You've already known that. Right, we started by writing that out, right? But what it says to you is that whenever you have Hamiltonians which have very nice symmetries in them, right? What does parity symmetry mean? Parity symmetry means that if you take x and take it to minus x, it should remain the same, right? And it should either remain the same or it should pick up a minus sign, both of these, right? Is what the are the eigenvalues of the parity operator, right? Because the thing to remember is that the parity operator square acting on psi of x is psi of x, right, for all psi of x. Which means that the parity operator essentially, the eigenvalues of the parity operator are only allowed to be plus minus one. That's all that is allowed to be, right? It's some matrix such that the square of it only produces plus one, right, the identity operator, which means that if you if you try and diagonalize it, um, you know, the, the matrix, then its eigenvalues are essentially plus minus one, right? So because plus one squared is plus one, and minus one squared is also minus one. So the eigenvalues can only be plus minus one, right? Because P is Hermitian. So, uh, sorry, again, I'm using P. Somebody correct me till I, till, I, till I remember to use the correct symbol, right? The parity operator pi, right? Now, what that means is that, um, but I already just showed you that the eigenvalue, or rather, the parity operator acting on p squared is p squared, right? Always remember that parity operator is an operator, which means it acts on states, right? Like all operators, when I, what did I do? I said I have a quantum state psi, and I want to take it to another quantum state phi, so I say that it is an operator times psi, right? So whenever you have operators acting this way, operator expectation values, right? If I want to write what is phi A phi, we discussed this, that this is simply psi, u dagger A u times psi. And so that's the operation that I'm doing here with the parity operator. It's an operator, so to transform it According to any any transformation, I have to do that kind of an object, right? And what I'm asserting is that pi dagger is pi. Right, and hence I can basically write this instead of, right? And uh, by hand, I just argued essentially that the parity operator is an even function. Uh, sorry, the uh, p square operator is an even function, right? What that means is that if the Hamiltonian Essentially, I write as p squared over 2m plus v, right? And I apply the parity operator on both.
right? So you have two options. Option number one, pi v pi is plus one, or option number two, pi v pi is minus one. Option number three, it's neither of these, right? It's neither an even function nor an odd function, right? So this is what I would call even potentials, right? And option number three is essentially not plus one or minus one, uh, sorry, plus v and minus v, right? Is not proportional to v, essentially. Right? And you can write examples of these ob objects out. So for instance, if I take the infinite square well, centered about x equals zero, that's an even potential. Because if I take x to minus x, what happens there? Right, the potential is the same. So that's exactly what this particular thing is, right? On the other hand, maybe I'm, I'm very crazy, and I write something that looks like that, right? So the linear ramp, potential v of x is equal to x, right? And that's an odd function, right? I wouldn't even write it. You can see these kinds of problems and this is the reason why I even wrote it down. But I wouldn't even write such a function because why? What's the problem with that function? Unbounded from below. Right? So if I think of this as a fundamental Hamiltonian, if it comes out as kind of a, um, you know, what's called an effective Hamiltonian, right? If it comes out as a toy model for something and you don't ever want to seek the ground state somehow, like you can get away with it, but like essentially this is an unbounded potential from below and so, you know, for you to even seek the ground state becomes a problem essentially, right? Because the ground state is a ball that's rolling to the left all the way out to minus infinity and that's a problem, right? So I would even, discount these from fundamentally existing, right? But the the category that does exist actually is are these guys, which is, you know, so if I take, you know, if I take a potential, right, which essentially looks like that, right? This is in the radial coordinate, but essentially, you know, actually that doesn't make any sense because the radial coordinate can't go from minus x to plus x. So, uh, so suppose I take something that, you know, that looks like that. You know, so some potential, some stuff, right? If it's a classical potential, you'd not be worried about it at all. Yeah, the particle can get stuck over there, stuck over there. That's the global minimum. That's the, you know, that's the second best, that's the second deepest minimum it looks like, right? No problems, that's the, you know, that's the maximum in the region, right? And then it looks like it's flying off to infinity somewhere, right? There's no problems. You could, you, you could in fact discuss how many bound states are there in this and so on. You do all kinds of crazy things with it, right? But this thing has no obvious symmetry. If you flip v, v of x to v of minus x, it has nothing, there's nothing going on for it, right? So you could have essentially potentials which look like, uh, which look like this. So let me draw a couple of examples, right? So I could take a potential that's that's even, right? And I could open essentially a little correction. So I could make a potential that looks like that, right? Can everyone see that? So what it's doing is it's an even potential on which there is an odd perturbation, a small, you know, a small potential that's slapped on top of it. That's essentially an odd function, right? So for some bounded region from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, you know, my potential is actually minus x, you know, from the looks of it, right? Minus alpha x, right? And you can do these kinds of things. These kinds of things you can do all the time, right? So what I'm trying to impress upon you is the following. The cleanest scenario that you have and the scenario that we will investigate, you know, that will come up very much in 1D quantum mechanics, uh, but not in real life, I, would, I should say, not, not very easily in real life, I should say, is essentially this situation. Because when the potential is as well even, the p square over 2m is already even. So the entire Hamiltonian is even, right? And you have something very special happening. 
And the special thing that's happening is that the Hamiltonian commutes with the parity operator, right? It's just spitting out plus one, right? Because part of it is not spitting out a plus one eigenvalue and the other one's not spitting out a minus, the entire thing is spitting out a plus one, right? So because the entire thing is spitting out a plus one eigenvalue, essentially what you have is, you have this kind of a situation, essentially. You can discuss, hey, what is E of lambda, what is E prime of lambda, and how do they relate to each other? Maybe I can reorganize these states in some way that makes more sense, right? And that exact discussion for the, for the free particle potential is exactly the one that we were having just now, which is what you have is any function psi of x of the form a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x, right, is a valid solution which has energy k, right, k squared over 2, right, h bar squared k squared over 2. So what is happening is that the, this is exactly the same expression as, as this statement, right? It's just, the, it's just that you can take superpositions because you're in a degenerate subspace. And all of those states have the same energy. But look at the sensible states that you can pick. If instead of writing it this way, right, I had written basically my wave function as A sine kx and B cosine kx, right, then they have definite parity, right? Not only are these the eigenstates of the, of the Hamiltonian, right, they're simultaneous parity eigenstates, right? And this is, the, this is the way in which you should organize your states, which actually makes the most sense because it's the way in which the symmetries are most apparent, right? The symmetries of the problem are most apparent. So in our case, what we've argued, in the abstract, what we've argued is that because parity commutes with the Hamiltonian, right, this case is what I'm discussing, right? Because parity commutes with the Hamiltonian, what you should be doing is something super clever, which is you should be organizing your eigenstates according to parity so that, you know, parity actually plays a very strong role, right? Almost naturally this comes to you, and this was essentially the point of homework two or homework three, I forget. If you look at this, uh, the square potential, the infinite square, right? Then your ground state essentially is an even function, your first excited states, an odd function, your second excited states, an even function, so on and so forth. They actually alternate in parity, right? They're good parity eigenstates, and that's the point. And the point actually is that inside, you essentially have a left going wave and a right going wave, and both of which are good solutions, and you're actually just taking the correct combinations of them and putting them together. Right, and matching boundary conditions, right? So that's the, that's the way to think about, think about parity, right? Now, we're going to do much, much more. We're going to do, um, you know, whenever um, you discuss symmetries in quantum mechanics, there is basically um, several important ones. There is complex conjugation. There is, um, you know, in terms of symmetries in, in, in one-dimensional quantum mechanics, let me be very modest in, in making my claim. Uh, there is complex conjugation that accompanies essentially time reversal and uh, parity, right? So it's a famous triplet called the CPT, right? And so, uh, and so what we'll see is essentially we'll see what each of these does to the, does to quantum mechanics, does to 1D quantum mechanics, how it allows us to organize quantum states, right? And, um, and how it allows us to actually address the problem, right? Address the problem of uh, solving for the eigen spectrum of the, of the Hamiltonian that we're interested in, and also solving for general dynamical properties. How is this quantity going to evolve? What is the magnetization going to be as a function of time, right? You can ask these kinds of real questions about quantum systems. And when you ask these real questions about quantum systems, the way you would answer these questions is to fall back on one of these platforms, you know, on one of these understandings of symmetry, and to start from there and proceed, you know, proceed from there, right? And um, and I want to make one or two more kind of uh, um, very kind of specific points, but before that, let me just take a question. What if V is a Dirac delta function? Is it even or odd? Right? So what you have to do, so, okay. So what you have to do is, for each of these cases, essentially, you can, you can just check what happens to the to the wave function. If you have a single Dirac delta function sitting somewhere, I don't even remember what the solution is, right? I think they're like traveling waves, but like with something, with, with discontinuity at the middle, right? 
Does anyone remember what the solution to a single Dirac delta function is? Attractive Dirac, no, but if you have a Dirac wall, what do you get? I can't remember anymore either, right? But you can solve this problem. We can, we can, we can deal with this, right? The attractive Dirac, as he's pointing out, this was on one of your homeworks as well, right? The attractive Dirac essentially has a bound state, right? But the arguments that I'm making apply. Dirac, the only complication with respect to Dirac is just that Dirac delta function has this weird problem that um, uh, that uh, essentially breaks one of the derivative continuities. It allows you to break one of the derivative continuities, right? It's not a, it's not a, you know, don't be mystified by it. Like, I mean, there's nothing to be worried about, right? So the kind of potentials that we'll be interested in, let me just say um, what we'll be interested in so that, you know, this actually motivates. Um, so what happens typically, I drew this diagram, not without, um, you know, not without forethought, right? Uh, not, not randomly, I had some idea as to why I wanted to draw the diagram. Because typically what happens is that if you have a quantum dot, right? If you have a quantum dot device, it's just a, it's just you take a substrate and you just dig a hole in it, right? I'm making a very bad, uh, uh, I'm giving you a very bad idea of how to build these things, right? Just dig a hole in some material and you try and stick an electron in it, right? It's the, and you have, you have a particle in a box, right? But the box is a finite box. Typically when you are a, you're a theorist or, you know, if you're doing the calculation on paper, you can just say it's a flat potential, right? So the potential is zero inside or, you know, some V naught inside and it is some other height outside, right? Typically it's never the case. If you actually look at real physical systems, right, it'll actually look a bit like that maybe. They'll be ugly. I mean, you know, they'll be they'll be real things. I mean, you know, they'll have real bits and blobs to them, right? And so, as a kind of now, how do you deal with this problem, right? If I gave you a problem like this, how do you deal with it, right? There are several ways. You can make some comments actually just by staring at this potential, right? As to how many bound states it has, so on and so forth. You can make some comments about it, right? But let me propose an idealization, which is that you take the idealization which looks like that, and you add everything in else as a perturbation. So you say next, the biggest problem is essentially a symmetric hole, right? And then the next biggest problem, so it's like doing a Fourier decomposition of a real curve, right? You can always take it in terms of sines and cosines, and you can just drop them in according to their weights, their Fourier coefficients, right? And typically what you'll get, is some idealized potential, which is the problem that we're solving, which are all of the problems that we're solving, plus perturbative, like a little bit of, you know, masala on top. And by essentially taking the first perturbation, you already have about 99% of the physics captured, right? If you're doing kind of very high level, like research work, where you need to know some very, very fine details of the electronic properties or something, for small but real physical systems, then you would go deeper, you do something more more complicated, but it's built on the same underlying principles, right? And the idea that I'm trying to point out to you is that um, is that organizing your wave functions according to the parity, right, is actually a very, very good idea. Why? I'll just directly tell you why, right? I'll tell you the kind of the upshot, like the, the real the real point of it. And then we can we can we can discuss this inside of 1D potentials and inside of blah, blah, blah. So the why is very simple. Suppose I want to make some sort of transition matrix, right? I want to calculate some sort of expectation value or transition value, right? What will I do? I have, I have some wave function phi of x, right? And I have some wave function psi of x, right? Actually, let me call it psi m of x and psi n of x. And I want to know, if I started in psi n, will I end up in psi m, right? So what am I asking? I'm saying I am in psi n. I have performed a unitary transformation. Will I end up in psi m, right? So I want to know one such quantity. So let us say, you know, for simplicity, that I can calculate this by making some, right? Something like that, right? Now, what happens? For, for the moment, just forget about u of x, right? 
what did you just classify all your ray functions with? Parity, right? So what are psi n and psi n? They don't have to be orthogonal because you can have sine x and sine 2x and sine 3x and sine 4x and so on and so forth, right? So sorry, there are, that, those are orthogonal as well, right? But what you can have is, is you can have um, you can have essentially arbitrary even functions. You appended, uh, you uh, you preempted me. Sorry. So you can have arbitrary wave, wave functions. If I hadn't taught you the Hermitian right have a basis bit, then I I would I wanted to. That's what I anticipated you to say. Uh, if you basically had not finished thinking about the Hermitian Hamiltonians having uh, the eigenfunctions of Hermitian Hamiltonians being a basis then what you would say is you would say there are some even functions and some odd functions, right? And some even functions and some odd functions can definitely have overlaps, right? So some even, two even functions can definitely have an overlap, two odd functions can def definitely have a non-zero integral onto them, right? But even and odd functions, when you multiply them and you integrate them, you get zero, right? And does everyone know this, right? So the underlying principle that I want to use is essentially Integral dx times not non-zero in general, non-zero in general, right? Does everyone know this? Who doesn't know this? Good. Right. So what you have are you have three functions here, right? And of course, as you rightly identified, these are these are basis sets essentially. So you can even just ignore the rest of that discussion. Uh, but the important bit is the following: just because they're basis sets, that that doesn't mean that the story is over, because what you have is another function in the middle, right? And so now what you have is this quantity can be either even or odd. This function can be either even or odd. This function may or may not have a parity property. Maybe it is an even function, maybe it is an odd function, maybe it's not an even or odd function, maybe it's an arbitrary function, right? So we can ask even, odd, and neither, right? Which I'll write as n, right? And if you have this kind of a setup, you can automatically tell which are non-zero terms, right? You can say even times even times even, this is non-zero, right? You can say even times odd times odd, this is non-zero, right? You can say odd times even times even, this is zero, right? So on and so forth. So you can figure out that unless there are two odds, right, which cancel each other, odd function times odd function gives you minus one squared, and then an even function sitting around, Right, or all three of them are even, essentially you'll get, if you have one odd, you get zero, right? If you're going to get an odd, you have to have two odds there, right? And all possible combinations, I've just written three particular sets, even, odd, odd, where the operator is odd, but you could have the other way around as well. You could have odd, odd, and then even here, right? All of those varieties, you now can figure out whether you'll get zero or non-zero values. Right? And what you have physically here, typically, is essentially just something that's like the potential. Right? Well, this comes from perturbation theory, which I don't want to get into, but essentially what you'll get here is something that looks like the potential. And so what you're arguing is what? What you're arguing is the following. You're asking, suppose I have a square well like this, and then I bump it a little bit like that. Right? What did I have before? So let's say, you know, I have a square well like this, and I bump the square well, and I create a bump that looks like that. Right? What, what are you asking? What you're asking is you're saying the square well has a ground state, which I know is even, has a first excited state, which I know is odd, has a second excited state, which I know is even, so on and so forth. And now you're asking, if I put a particle in the ground state, where will it go? Right? So you can look at this diagram and you can say, oh, that's an even function, that's an odd function, that's an even function, and that's an odd potential, right? So let's make the guess, even, 
on the left hand side, that's an even function. Odd potential in the middle. So what, what can it transition to? Say it louder. Odd, right? There's one odd because, so if there isn't, there isn't another odd, you can't get non-zero values. So the only non-zero transitions that it can make are essentially of this form. It cannot make this transition, right? And whatever higher, it can also make the odd transition to the next level that's sitting up there, but it's much weaker. This has to go much higher, right? And you've already learned all of forbidden rules, right? All the forbidden transitions and selection rules, so on and so forth, you've already captured all of the essence of them. That's it, you're done. That is the entire story of the entire set of them, right? And it comes directly out of a consequence of discussing this simple commutation relationship. That's the reason that this entire thing is powerful, right? So it's presented in an abstract way, blah, 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 but essentially this is 90% of its use in atomic physics will be to do stuff like this, which is you will run into a perturbation and the perturbation will have a certain parity because that's the way we would like to think of perturbations, simply because if you have some odd perturbation, like some weird perturbation, you would just essentially try and decompose it and pick the most symmetric bits of it, right, anti-symmetric, like parity bits of it. And then you try and stick them in and see how you would, how what transitions would be, would be promoted and not promoted, right? And at the level of spatial wave functions, that's the entire set of them. That's the entire physics of it, right? Now, if you throw in kind of more conservation rules, right? This is essentially kind of a conservation rule that comes out of the fact that, you know, this is parity preserving, right? This is the, this essential rule is the thing that's producing all of that, right? Now, if you throw in a couple of more kind of rules that come from angular momentum or that come from something else, right? From spin transitions and so on and so forth, you get all of them, that's it, right? And we'll discuss them when we get to it, right? But what I wanted to do, I always like to teach parity alongside this discussion, right? It's typically avoided because you, I have to teach you perturbation theory which comes in another semester, blah, blah, blah. So I just made a cartoon of it, right? To tell you what's happening, right? Which I hope you got. Because this is really the point of it. The real reason that you would want to do this is not just because it's cute and it's fancy and you can organize your Hamiltonian eigenstates according to their parity values. This is all good, but who cares, right? I mean, this is the question that you would ask. And I would say, oh, well, you can't actually understand the relative weights of atomic transitions and especially the missing lines in atomic transitions unless you actually understand the parity, right? And for that reason and that reason alone, you should pay attention to it if nothing else, right? So this is one of the kind of um, simplest instances of a kind of profound consequence of, um, of, uh, of the symmetry that a potential has, that a potential brings um, to allow transitions in quantum mechanics, right? So what I want to do is essentially go back and essentially formalize the entire discussion and, and make some very, very um, systematic statements. So what I want to do is essentially the following. I want to discuss over, the, over this class and the next couple of classes, I want to discuss um, several important results which I would loosely bind together into kind of one discussion. Um, and they are essentially symmetries and their consequences to 1D quantum mechanics. Um, so what I want to do is discuss uh, a very important theorem, which is that there is no degeneracies in 1D quantum mechanics, uh, which we will do today. Then um, I'll do relationship between uh, C and PT, right? Complex conjugation, parity, and time reversal, all right? And then as a kind of example of all of these uh, symmetries strongly constraining physics, I want to do scattering theory. Right, of uh, essentially 1D potential uh, potential barriers. And we'll actually see how, by just using kind of simple um, uh, arguments, you can arrive at the same physics that we've arrived at before. We concluded that states are described by vectors, right, or functions in function space, and the transitions between states are described by unitary operators, right? So the unitarity comes out of this kind of discussion as well. You can, you, can come, you can come to the same conclusion on unitarity by going through the, uh, through the symmetries of the problem argument, right? And so we'll do the exact same thing. And so I want to show you um, scattering 
essentially two ways. Um, and uh, so we'll solve the transmission problem and we'll solve the scattering problem. And I'll make a comment on the S matrix, which will become important if you, for those of you who take uh, uh, high energy physics and stuff of that sort. And then um, what I'll do is just, you know, round out the discussion um, with uh, some finite square well physics and bound states and so on and so forth, right? So that's the, that's the rough plan. Okay, questions or comments? This mom, this operator is d by dx. Yeah. Okay. No, that's not true, because d by dx actually changes even functions to odd functions, and odd functions to even functions. So what that means is that d by dx can only allow you to make a transition from odd functions to even functions, or even functions to odd functions, because all others will just be disallowed. If you started with two, e two even functions, you take a d, this becomes odd, and then odd times even is just zero. So d by dx as an operator, essentially, right? So if you have your eigenstates essentially, again, lined up with parity, even odd, even odd, so on and so forth, d by dx will only allow you to make those, uh, sorry, will allow you to only make these kinds of transitions, right? It will disallow this transition. It will just disallow it. Parity and its and uh, you know parity eigenstates are introduced typically they're introduced kind of way before you use them Right, so it's a bit like basically Me trying to tell you right that you should take copper and You should you know think of copper wires right blah 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 long before I talk about music Right I would say it's the exact opposite way in which you should talk about it. I should first tell you how awesome music is, and once you're happy and impressed that music is awesome, then I can tell you how to get to music, which is, oh, you need copper strings or you know, copper wires. You should string them up this way and this and that and the other. So, um, you know, so much of my, my complaint with some of the way quantum mechanics is taught has to do essentially with, with, um, with it makes a logical sense from a mathematical preliminaries point of view that you would want to introduce the simpler things first and then you know, six months later you'll basically realize why you need them. But I think that actually is, uh, is counterproductive for you to remember, um, you know, like, so what I'm hoping is next semester at some point somebody will tell you, let us start doing selection rules, right? Or let us start doing perturbation theory. And I just want you to just immediately flash on all of this discussion because parity will become deeply important there. So instead of, just have a telling you about parity as a kind of goal onto itself and you know, so on. I'm just telling you where it's applied the most. Kind of, you know, 90% of its application, I'm just telling you right now. So when you come across it, you will just not be mystified at all. You just go, of course I understand that. It simply follows from the fact that even functions times odd functions, when you integrate, you get zero. And why am I integrating? This is the question you may be asking. You're integrating essentially because that's the way you would find expectation values, transition rules, Right? So if you wanted to find, you know, transition probabilities or expectation values, that's how you do it. It'll be under some integral with either one or more variable, right? And so the entire discussion will just be essentially about, about one such quantity. It'll either be something that looks like psi star m of x, u of x, psi n of x, or it'll be something that looks like psi star m of y, u of x comma y times psi n of y, right? integrated over x and y will be some number, right, that you're interested in. And what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to say, let's not even get into the details of what those numbers are and what those potentials are and what those scenarios are where you should discuss them. But can you not appreciate, with me, can you not appreciate the simple argument that in fact this quantity is either zero or non-zero? If it's non-zero, there's more work for you to do. But the moment it's zero, it's a strong constraint on the system. This system is not allowed to do the following, right? And so all of the forbidden transitions in atomic spectra are down to this, right? Are down to essentially this argument, kind of a bigger, like a cousin of this argument, right? But the essence of the argument is just sitting here, right? Is that good? Good. So this is an example, right? So what I want you to think of is I want you to think of the entire family of symmetries, right? The entire family of, you know, of I make a statement about how my particular Hamiltonian is special and how that affects basically everything. 
and uh, because okay actually let me do cnpt first before i get into this no degeneracy no degeneracy essentially sits in a corner so let me show you another example of something very powerful right so here is a schrodinger equation right now let me say h are reals so the constraint on the hamiltonian becomes uh, the transpose constraint as opposed to the hermitian constraint right so the hamiltonian does not have to be a hermitian operator it just has to be it has to be a a symmetric operator, right? And uh, it has to still be lower bounded, right? This still is something that it needs to satisfy. Then basically take T to minus T, right? So what happens? You get a I D by D of minus T. So the question that she's asking is, well, everything that you've said is true of any even function, any odd function, is true of everything. So where does, you know, where does parity come in, right? Or where does the wave function come in? So parity comes in because when I say even function or odd function, I'm specifying the parity of that function. So let us break this discussion down into two discussions. Discussion number one, everything that I said is true for any functions. I'm just talking about a property of integrals, right? An integral over an even function times an odd function is zero over the entire range of the two functions, right? And the reason for it is basically because the integral doesn't carry the integration variable, so when you flip the sign, essentially one of them picks up a minus sign, right? This is obvious to everyone. Now, so this much is true. You agree that this much is true for all functions. Now what is special or how do I connect it to physics? What I'm saying is I'm saying, combine this simple fact with what you have just learned. What you have just learned is that if you have a Hamiltonian that commutes with parity, then it essentially, you can take the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which for instance are e to the plus minus ikx, and you can reclassify them as parity eigenstates, right? So the eigenstates are simultaneous eigenstates of parity and the Hamiltonian, which means that not only are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, they're either even functions or odd functions, because those are the two eigenvalues of the parity operator, right? So for, in, for example, this example that's staring us in the face, e to the ikx, you can reclassify and say, instead of saying e to the plus ikx and e to the minus ikx are solutions, I can say cosine kx and sine kx are solutions, and my general wave function is a linear combination of cosine and sines, right? That's just the parity res, uh, restatement of the e to the ikx statement, right? I'm just writing this as a symmetric and anti-symmetric wave function. But the moment I do that, right, what am I saying? What I'm saying to you is, if you have, let's say, a real problem like this, right? You have a problem where basically, so the free particle is somewhat weird for some reason, which I'll get to in a second. But let's go back to the, to the square well potential, right? So the square well potential essentially is a symmetric potential about the origin, which means it has good parity. It's, it's parity eigenvalues plus one. So P square over two M, right? plus the potential, which is essentially zero in right there, right, and infinity outside, the infinite square well symmetric about the center actually has good parity about the center, right? And because it has good parity, you can classify all of its eigenstates as parity eigenstates. And if you classify them, what do you get? You get essentially these uh, sine and pi x over L kind of objects, or sines and cosines alternatively, right? So what you get is, is these alternative even and odd functions. So now what I'm saying to you is I'm saying, take these two facts that you have learned and put them together. Number one, quantum states, eigenstates of good potentials, interesting potentials that we're going to study are either even functions or odd functions. Fact number two, product of even times odd integrated is zero. Fact number three, to compute transitions or expectation values, you have to do integration. So when you put all these three things together, what you suddenly realize is that if you have, for instance, let me even be even more bold and give you an even crazier example. 
right? I won't tell you how this comes about, but I'm just going to tell you. Again, this is something that you will see in your, in your perturbation theory class. If you have essentially a Hamiltonian, which you can write as H naught plus V, where V is a, is a small term. So suppose let's say H naught is much larger than V, right? You have to immediately ask me what does it mean for two matrices to be larger than each other, right? What does it mean? There are two matrices. What do you mean one is larger than the other, right? So I mean in some norm sense, right? So you take the matrix norm, right? You know how to take norms of function of operators. So take some matrix norm. It doesn't matter which one you take. So take some P norm of some sort. And any P norm essentially uh, is good enough to make the statement that I'm making. If you want to take the uh, take the infinity norm, it's essentially the largest eigenvalue, but anyway. Um, so let's say that this thing has eigen eigenvalues E lambda. And now the question that you want to ask is, if I put something in the ground state and I switch on V, right? What happens? How does it make, how, do, how does the energy level change? Right, and what transitions does it make? Right, these are the two questions you would ask, right? This is, I want you to understand, right? Let's just do real physics. I mean, there's no, there's no shame in kind of, you know, there's no need for us to wait for it, right? The, if you take a, if you take a real atom, right? And I can do this analysis, I have to do it on paper before I show it to you, but if I take a real atom and, um, you know, just hydrogen atom, for instance, and you take the, um, you switch on a laser, just an ordinary lab laser or something that looks like a laser pointer, right? Laser pointers are like five milliwatts typically, right? And you can take the laser and you can estimate from electromagnetic theory how much strength of electric field and magnetic field is on it, right? And also you can estimate from basically just Coulomb attraction, so on and so forth, what the electric field, that the electron feels from the nucleus. And the electron feels a nuclear electric field, which is, you know, which is about a billion times or something like that stronger than the laser field that you switch on for typical weak lasers, right? The only exception to this is what's, uh, is the field of kind of, you know, is, is when you get into these, uh, uh, what are called ultra strong lasers, right? So what's, what's essentially called uh, ultra fast optics and so on and so forth. So when you get into those kinds of very specialized areas, then uh, auto second physics and you know higher harmonic generation blah blah blah. There are some phrases if you come across them. But when you get into those kinds of areas, then of course um, things get very different. But I'm talking about all of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, right? I mean the lasers appeared in the mid 50s or whatever, mid mid 50s, mid 60s, mid 60s I think, right? And um, and so for like about 40, 45 years of our you know of our uh, of our history, right? As uh, uh, people who've done physics with light and matter, right? Uh, essentially, the, part of the the V, which is the laser field, has been about a billion times weaker than the H naught, right? It's ten, like the 10 to the minus seven or 10 to the minus nine, I forget now, but super small number, right? But that super small number doesn't mean it's small for you. It's actually a laser point, like it's a laser that you're switching on, right? It's actually a very, what you would think of as a massive thing, but for the field, for the atom, it's trivial, right? In those situations, there's something called perturbation theory that applies, right? Have you done perturbation theory in classical mechanics already? No, are you going to? No, okay, okay, never mind. Um, right, so you can do perturbation theory. Perturbation theory just has to do with differential equations. It doesn't have any, it's not uh, unique to quantum mechanics. Uh, it's uh, a bit of a misfortune for us that we actually only teach it in quantum mechanics these days because it's much better for you to learn it in classical mechanics. It's much simpler that way. Uh, but anyway, so um, in perturbation theory, I'm going to make some statements, right, which you just have to take on face value, but then we'll get back to this discussion using those statements. I need those results. In perturbation theory, the correction, let's say, so the ground state energy basically is the ground state energy at when V is equal to zero, right? plus something that looks like a delta E term, right? And typically the way perturbation theory works is it's a power series expansion. So what I would do is I would put a lambda there and make lambda small, 10 to the minus seven. So I would do a lambda, lambda squared, so on and so forth, right? And I'm only interested in the smallest correction, right? And I'm just going to write the formula down. All I'm saying to you is I'm going to write a formula which may not make sense or may not be unjust, it may be unjustified, but let's just run with it for a second. So the correction to the ground state energy, right, essentially is the ground state wave function expectation value 
unperturbed ground state wave function expectation value with the um, with the potential, right? So I wrote this as essentially e lambda zero, right? So if I take v, set it to zero, and just solve the problem, set lambda to zero, solve the problem. I have the eigenstates. This is exactly what you do on a daily basis. The eigenstates of the square well potential, the eigenstates of the hydrogen atom, the eigenstates of blah, 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 right? That's all you're doing all day long, producing eigenstates of Hamiltonians that are easy to solve, that are solvable technically, right? Those are the objects, and the perturbation term is, is sitting right there, right, V. And the lambda essentially goes into the definition that I've written about, right? The lambda gets absorbed upstairs. So this quantity is what I want you to stare at, but this is exactly the kind of quantity that I'm talking about. And why I am talking about parity as being an important quantity for you to study to begin with. Because what I am saying to you is that if this V, right, what is V? In le real laser physics or whatever, right? It's either the electric field or the magnetic field. Those are the kinds of interesting things that you will run into, right? And the question is, is the electric field even or odd? Or is the magnetic field even or odd, right? Again, there is no good reason for you to know this, but the electric field essentially is like position and the magnetic field essentially is like momentum, right? And so, sorry, so which is to say the electric field is odd and the magnetic field is even, right? So what happens is because of that, essentially you have something that's an odd function and you automatically can tell me that this thing and this thing have, you know, because they're both the same quantum state, this is even, even, or this is odd, odd, right? And this thing sitting inside is odd, which means what is the first order correction? Zero. You didn't even learn anything about, we bypassed perturbation theory, and uh, we bypassed all of those things. All that you needed was parity. Actually, you even needed less than that. All that you needed was to simply remember the simple fact that when you integrated Gaussian functions and derivatives of Gaussian functions, you came across, which is that, you know, any even function times any odd function when you integrate it over is zero. Bus, you just take that and you plug it in there, you get the answer that you want, right? Transitions, essentially, you know, if you calculate the eigens eigenstate correction, then that then they involve all kinds of transitions. And all the transitions you can immediately just work out as well. And given the fact that there is a perturbation parameter here, right, there is a parameter of strongness, what happens is it gets weaker and weaker, which means once you do first order, second order, you don't even ever go to need to go to third order. Right, typically this will be very unusual for you to want to go to third order. Right, not unheard of, but you know, you can do it if you need to. But you know, typically all of the physics arguments are done effectively by first and second order perturbation theory. Right? Now you stick time dependence in there and you take derivatives and you have time dependent perturbation theory, right? Another story for another time, right? But is that, this is too much introduction that I've given you for the parity operand. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry that I gave you this introduction because I actually think that it's better for you to learn it inside here than it is for you to, I mean, if I was to teach, I would teach it fully inside this. I would actually just open up this perturbation theory as a lesson and just teach it, you know? Because it's actually much simpler that way. I would get you exactly what you where you wanted to go, right? Um, but uh, but that aside, can you can you appreciate essentially the point that I'm trying to make, which is all possible things that you would be interested in would roughly look like this. It would essentially be some E m lambda, E n lambda, and some potential. This would if you can calculate this generic transition operator, then you're done essentially. And the point I'm trying to make is essentially that by looking at this generic transition operator. Right? By looking at the symmetries of the underlying states, you can already decide what are the, what are the kind of important terms sitting around, right? And what kind of things are allowed and not allowed, right? Okay. So what's happening is you have a, you have a Hamiltonian which has some energy levels, right? What happens when you apply a perturbation? What is a perturbation? Right? What is it physically? It's some potential, right? So you're applying a laser field or you're applying a voltage. You're, you're doing something to it, right? What are you doing when you, when, you, when you do that? What are you doing, right? What can you do? You can essentially move these energy levels, right? Right, maybe that's what it does. Maybe it does nothing, 
right? But what you want to know is essentially you want to know what is this, right? And typically what this is, it's some complicated function of the strength of the perturbation, which is lambda in that equation over there, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm just computing the first order correction to it, right? Do you understand what that sentence means? Right. So perturbation theory is very simple. I, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm sorry that this is a, this is a distraction that I never intended to. Um, but perturbation theory is, is very simple. It's essentially simply the idea that, um, you know, if you if you ever took a computer coding class, you know, I have to give an example which is uh, appropriate to this age. So if you ever took a computer coding class, you might have heard this. Uh, this thing which is spend 90% of your problem on where the code is running 90% of the time, you know? So what is perturbation theory doing? It's basically saying you have some problem and you've, and you've, and you've, and you've perturbed the potential by a little bit, right? Now if the perturbation term, if this quantity lambda is 10 to the minus seven, let's say, right? What I'm doing is I'm saying the change in the ground state energy Right? The change, the ground state energy, this is the ground state energy at V equals zero, or rather at uh, lambda equals zero, right? This quantity is proportional to 10 to the minus seven. This quantity is proportional to 10 to the minus 14. Do you understand that if I write the decimal places, you'll never need to ever calculate this? You never in your life need to calculate this unless this was exactly zero, right? So what I'm doing is I'm saying this EG, which is the energy of this, of this entire thing, is some complicated function of lambda, and I'm just essentially expanding it out, right? Why is it a complicated function of lambda? Because you have to evolve the quantum state and then compute the uh, sorry, you have to re-diagonalize the quantum state. And when you re-diagonalize the quantum state in terms of the old basis, you can get some complicated, right? You can get some complicated thing. If this is not clear to you, then I, I, I should just, I invite you to just wait for perturbation theory, right? More questions? Okay, so we have time just for one quick theorem. So. Let me just finish that theorem and, and call it a day. So let me just repeat this entire argument, right? Um, I broke the, I broke my rhythm for it. So what I want to discuss is essentially 1D potentials, right? And I want to discuss yet another consequence that, you know, so what I discussed all of today's class was parity, but try to contextualize it within the, uh, within the thing that you would really need it for, which is, you know, which is to do selection rules and perturbation theory and so on. So what I'm doing next is essentially trying to tell you, you know, look, if you think of how important the symmetries, um, you know, that act on a Hamiltonian, how important those symmetries are for the things that the Hamiltonian can and cannot do, the quantum states can and cannot do, right? Um, here is another example of, of such a kind of strong constraint. So take the Schrodinger equation, right? I can write it normally. I don't have to write it this way. Right? And let Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian be a real function, right? This is true almost for all of the kind of 1D simple problems that you're looking at, right? Harmonic oscillator square, well, blah, blah, blah. Harmonic oscillator is another example where you have even odd, even odd, even odd. Just look at it, right? Look at the functions. So take t to minus t, what do you get? You get i d by d of minus t times psi is h. Sorry, everything has time in it. Right, this is time dependent short equation. Right, and now what happens is essentially, this minus t just essentially comes out, and it comes minus i del t of psi of x. Uh, comma minus t is h of psi of x comma minus t.
right? Now suppose I take i to minus i. So I take complex conjugation on this entire thing, right? I get minus i star del t psi star of x comma minus t is h psi star of x comma minus t, right? And minus i star is plus i. So I get i del t psi star of x comma minus t, right? Is h psi star of x comma minus t, right? Contrast it with i del t of psi of x comma t is h psi of x comma t, right? And I also want to remind you that I have to technically do h star there, but h star is h because I assume that it's a real Hamiltonian, right? And so what that means is that both of those wave functions actually obey the same Schrodinger equation. Right? So we'll see what that means, right, next class.